not a con. Uh, my name is Bruce Petro, and uh, I work for uh, AG Interactive, that's American Greetings Interactive. I'm the CTO there. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a CTO is, some people think it's uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, others say it's clearly too old for what I'm doing. And depending on the day, sometimes it, it is, I feel like I'm too old for the job. It's a very exciting job. Um, by way of introduction, uh, AG Interactive uh, includes the websites that we have at uh, AmericanGreens.com, BlueMountain.com. We do websites for Yahoo for e-greetings. Come on in, have a seat. It's okay. Um, and uh, more recently, we have acquired two mobile divisions uh, that will put uh, ringtones and graphics on your mobile phones. If you have Verizon, uh, please go to MIDI ringtones uh, and buy your ringtones. By MIDI ringtones. Uh, that's one of our properties. Uh, it is a, a very fast moving um, business, not that, not that uh, any others are not. And what I hope to do today is give you a little insight into a topic that I think no matter what you, you are in the field of IT, that you, you need to have some sensitivity towards. Because if you, if you do, uh, I think you'll be uh, that much further ahead of the rest of the pack. And in these days, I don't know who couldn't benefit from that. So uh, I'm not sure we're going to take the full amount of time, but we are here. To, and I, I do want to make this interactive. That's why I'm down here on the floor rather than up there on the, on the, the podium. So please, um, at any time, if you let me, I'll speak all day. And I, and I don't think you want that. I, I, I want this to, uh, to be interactive as we can. But welcome again. So okay, there's a there's not a lot of uh, gray-haired folks out there. That's okay, uh, or in my case, thin-haired folks. Um, that if you have been around for a while, this is the kind of hell that if you're in IT and particularly in management that you've been through. I mean, these things up here uh, have been tough. And as I say, that you either got, if you've, if you've been in the business long enough and, and gone through this, you either have gray hair or less hair than you had when you started. This is a lot of stuff. And so any of you who have, who have been there um, and survived, I, I, you know, congratulations, okay? Because it's a lot. Okay? And those of you who haven't, you just got to be understand that these things here, uh, in fact, have been significant in terms of what it's done to our world in IT. It turned from, from great expectations, believe me, being with AmericanGreens.com, it was a great ride up. Okay? The whole dot com thing, right here in Cleveland, we were riding it up. We were in a building that had... Um, Lunch brought in, breakfast brought in. You know, we were out in a warehouse. It was really had the, the uh, all the network stuff running on trays in the up in the ceiling. It was just like being in, in San Francisco, man. And so we rode that up. Uh, we worked uh, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, trying to get that stuff out there to be the best. And then the bubble burst. Oh my goodness, that was uh, that was horrible. So uh, it's uh, it's a real exciting environment, but it also it is one that, that will provide a lot of challenges. Okay, so. Meanwhile, while you're confronting all that stuff that was on the previous slide, this stuff happens. You, you still got to do all this stuff. Now, most of you uh, are, are most of you in, in, in like programming, right? Okay, well, you know, somebody, if it isn't you, uh, somebody up the food chain is, is working on all these other things. And interesting thing about this list is that, uh, one, it, it doesn't seem to change over time. I just picked up uh, Computer World. Uh, the most recent edition showed the top six things on, on uh, 
ex uh, IT executives, it's pretty much the same list. It's been the same list for the last 10 years or so. So, uh, but it's out there. Somebody's got to do this. And it's assumed that you do these things in any shop today. You got to keep that network up. You got to prove your, your value, yada, yada, yada. Okay? Somebody's got to do that. Hopefully it's not you. But if you and your group are going to survive to the next paycheck, somebody's got to be working on this stuff. And hopefully they are. Ah, but now here, here's the rub. Okay? It's not enough. It's, it's not enough. Today in business, it's all about what have you done for me, not lately, but what are you going to do for me tomorrow? And, it, and it's all about innovation. Innovation is the key. And part of what I'm going to try and convince you of here today is that you people in IT have good news and bad news. The, the, the good news is that um, you're going to be affected by this and have an opportunity to actually do something meaningful for whatever company or organization you work for. The bad news is they're going to expect a lot out of you. So today, if you take away anything, I want you to have a little better appreciation for what is likely to be expected of you and furthermore, what you might be able to do about it to get a jump on, on that. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, you, you pretty much got to be living in a cave somewhere not to he hear about innovation. And there's a couple of examples up there uh, on, in terms of publications that are in the last couple of months that talk about this thing about innovation. And I just had something uh, recently where Boston Consulting Group, uh, I'm going to apologize for reading this because it was, just came out, recently reported that 500 executives that it, it surveyed in 47 countries rank innovation as one of their company's top three strategic priorities in 2005. Wow. Innovation. Wasn't a word in anybody's vocabulary probably five years ago, but, but here it is. Business Week. It was the 75th anniversary. So you're this big magazine. What do you devote the issue to? Innovation. Uh, CIO Magazine. Honorees one, uh, for their top CIOs. A new category as of last year and how they rate people. Innovation on the CIOs. Forbes. Um, ranks the top 100 companies on five factors. How they you know, come up with the, the top couple. Guess what? Innovation was one of those things. Procter & Gamble's up there. I have a quote, and I apologize for reading this. This will be the last thing I read here. Um, from the chairman of the board when they released their quarterly earnings, he says, P&G strategies are working. The strength of our innovation program and the diversity and strength of our portfolio continues to give me confidence that we can deliver yet another year at or above long-term targets. Here he is, it's the CEO, Procter & Gamble. They make toothpaste, everything else, right? He's talking about innovation is the way it's gonna uh, help his company grow. Finally, Fortune's up there. They had, a, in one of their issues, they had an innovation special. And I don't know about you, but my company wasn't in there. The companies that were there were like Pixar, Virgin Mobile, Starbucks. AG Interactive wasn't there. Okay? I got envied about those people are there and, and I wasn't. But it's in the news. And you should be aware of it. Okay, so, so what are we talking about? Right? Innovation. Here, here are a couple of definitions. And I, so I'm not going to read them because a good presenter doesn't read them. He lets you read them. So I'll tell you my best example of innovation. Uh, last uh, December, my wife, who I love dearly, okay, coerced me to go with her Christmas shopping. 
And I hate it. I, I hate Christmas shopping. So we're walking through the store. I don't know what it was, Target or something like that. And she's looking at decorations, and I kind of wander off looking for anything that's not related to, you know, the, the stuff that she's doing. So I come across um, this device that's for Christmas trees. And it's, it's this uh, pl little ball, okay, in a, in a platform. And it was advertised as being the easiest Christmas tree holder in the world. And, but you could see it, that um, somebody had really thought this out, that it was a ball and socket kind of arrangement. So it, in order to level the tree, you had infinite flexibility. And in terms of holding the, the tree in the, the stand, it had a little ratchet thing that, that was infinitely uh, adjustable. And it's like, God, somebody finally got it. Because all I remember for years and years was going out with the kids, cutting down the tree, bringing it home. Everybody's real happy. Dad put it in the stand. Well, Dad's out there, you know, knee deep in snow with the, with the hatchet trying to, to, to get it in there. And, you know, they were all waiting, you know, and, oh, gee, you know, so that's why we have an artificial tree <laughs> today. I didn't want to do that anymore. I was too old for that. But you walk down the aisle and you go, that is it. Somebody really finally gets it. That's innovation. That's my innovation story. Somebody finally got it. Okay? And that's what we're looking for. Some of the definitions here are what it is. I like the epiphany. Any of you guys, you know, um, when, you know when you see it, and, and this, this, this could apply to even somebody's program, somebody's code. I mean, like the iPod. Right? There's innovation. How cool is that, right? Somebody got it, right? And, and that's the kind of thinking that we're talking about. And it doesn't have to be big. It's, not, it's really not a scale. It can apply to your own program, if you will. You can be innovative just at that level. You don't have to, to build the, the tree stand like that. Um, but it, it's just not the next thing, by the way. That's, that's, that's a good, good part of what it's not. It's just not the next idea that you just keep doing and doing and doing and doing. That's easy. Okay? That's not innovation. So, I don't mean to be real uh, educational here about what it is, but the whole point about it is, I think it's like the pornography thing. You'll see it. It's like the tree stand. When you see it, you'll know it. That's innovation. Uh, let me apologize for having to, to go up there and, you know, put the slides up. This was put together assuming I had a remote. Ah, never assume, okay? Um, so, there's a couple of problems. These are faced by um, managers in IT, but it's affected, everybody in IT is affected. Because you, you could be looking at this from a management perspective, or you could be the person affected. Remember we, in the beginning I told you, uh, if you're in IT uh, and you made it, you, you've done something right, okay? You could think you're doing something right, all these things right, but there's some problems. And the first one here deals with staff. And this is, part, this is actually a, a, an example I get at, at work. You know, the good news is I've got a staff now that uh, it's almost five years out of the dot-com bubble when it burst. We got rid of all the bad people. We got rid of all the mediocre people. And what we have left are good people and really good people. And they've been with us for, oh, probably on average five years now. And that's a great thing because you all kind of work together. When I say PDB, you know what it is. When I say ABC, you know what it is. I mean, so, you know, we don't have to document a lot because we all know what it all is. It's a great thing. We're working like a team, right? That's the good news. Okay, what's the bad news? That's what it says up there. 
We have no expert. My boss came to me uh, last year, he says, who do we have that's on the cover of, you know, computer world? Who, who do we have that when you go to the Python conference, they're presenting, or in fact, even better, somebody's given them a, an award for whatever it is they did. And I go, hmm, got no one. But, but boss, I got, I got a lot of good people. But his question is, do you have any great people? And you know, unfortunately, the answer is, I said, no, I, I don't. I mean, we, we're in Cleveland, for God's sakes. Um, that, I didn't say that, okay? You can't say that to the CEO. That's almost like the kiss of death. But in fact, um, you know, we had another example where we have a, a gentleman, uh, let's call him Fred, and, and he's doing one of the crappiest jobs in the company. This guy is supporting um, mass emailing software. I mean, it's the bottom of the barrel. And, and Fred, you know, does an okay job. And, but, you know, he's, uh, he's not one of the stars. And so my boss says, get rid of him and get a person in there who's an expert. I said, well, that expert isn't going to want to do that job. His reply was, well, that guy will, will have, be able to do that job in half the time and then, then go around and go do something else. Okay? That's a problem. Okay? Come on in, gentlemen. Come on in. <laughs> We're going to be here for a while. Let me make up your mind for you. Have a seat. For those of you who are just joining us, we're talking about innovation. And, and the points I've tried to make before, and I could ask the audience because they've all been very attentive, is that it is one of the critical things uh, in any company or business in terms of positioning your company for growth. And I'm here to try to convince you that I, anybody in the IT area has a role to play and the more we know, the better off you and probably your company is going to be. And now you're up to snuff. So, okay, what do we do? And there, there's a suggestion up there. If, if you're in management, you better be doing this. If you're one of the, uh, the people who really do work, you ought to be thinking about yourself in this context. Get yourself training. You gotta fight for it. You gotta get out there. It's training and exposure to the outside. That's, what, that's how we fight inbreeding. This gentleman here and I were talking about uh, the recent Python conference where he linked up with some people from, uh, from our company. The reason those guys are out there is to steal ideas. I, you know, I make no, no bones about it. That's why they're there. They're there to get, get into the community and to steal everything they can to come back and uh, apply it. My rule is, if I send you out to, to a, a training class or a conference, you can go again next year if you can demonstrate that you, can pay, you paid for your trip by having to come back and apply something. That's what we want to do. You've got to, for your own self, fight for that education, fight for that opportunity to get out there and get exposed to this stuff. There's a wonderful community out there, uh, particularly in the open source, for those of you like myself, okay, who are very much open source advocates, that's out there in community that you can learn from. Fight for that for, as an individual. If you're in any kind of management, you need to do that for your people. They may not become experts, but you're sure as heck going to get a, a, a reward on your investment in their time if you can send them out. But many times you'll find that it's up to you as an individual to make that case. In order to, because the first thing that goes when money's tough, when money's tight, is the travel budget, the training budget. Okay, that's part of, uh, part of the problem, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
of what the problem is. By the way, if you are an A player, okay, an A player is anybody out there to me that is any a regional or nationally recognized for something that they do. Um, that is a good thing. Um, how you do that? It's by being innovative. That's that's my uh, my advice to you. Anybody can be innovative, and as an individual. Okay. So what's what's next? What's wrong? It's methodology. So uh, this is one of the killers that um, anybody in management, when they go into a new company, the first thing they usually criticize, other than their predecessor, is the lack of methodology. So they work real hard, and they come up with a methodology. This is uh, you know, your development practices. And so finally, you, you, know, you, you get to the point where you and your, your uh, cohorts are all working together because we all have this approach, right? And ever, since everybody knows what to do, we get a lot done. And you're very effective because we're, we're churning out the next thing. That's a good thing about having a methodology. Great thing, great thing to have. Here's a problem. And it's up there. It's the flexibility. And you don't take risks. You, you have no incentive to deviate from that methodology. In fact, if you do, you're probably penalized. But it's easy to, to fall in the trap. You go out, and the larger, I, I submit to you, the larger the corporation, the more emphasis it will be on a standardized methodology, and deviation from the methodology is discouraged. And what that means is you're going to just do a replication of the thing that the guy did last time. And you're not going to be innovative. It is a, it is a kiss of death to innovation. And uh, I, can, I can tell you, eh, a little bit of shame, but OK. This is what's, what has happened in, uh, where I work. We kind of woke up one day and said, gee, we're real proud of ourselves. We can knock out projects on time, on budget, like nobody else. But we're doing just that. And we're doing it in a way just to get it done. That's a problem. So what do you do? Well, there's some suggestions up there. When I talk about slow learners, that's a, that's a quote from a book that I'll put up uh, a little bit later in the presentation. These people aren't slow from the standpoint that they just don't get it. But these are people who challenge the system. We have a guy whose name is Scott in our organization. Scott is uh, viewed as a gadfly and a gnat, OK? Because he questions everything you, you want him to do. Now, Scott's only problem is that he does it in a way that, that makes him nobody wants to speak with him. <laughs> You can challenge all in, in a good way and a bad way. Scott's problem is that he, he doesn't seem to have understood that difference, and so he just is Scott, and nobody wants to talk to him. But Scott is important to the organization, because you know that no matter what you propose, Scott's going to come up with a reason why it won't work. And you want that. You really do, as long as it's done in the right way. But, but I encourage you to be that person, not be Scott. But be the person that, that challenges it. That's going to that's gonna help you be on the track toward the innovation. Tweak the prioritization rules. Um, that usually in, in companies, you've got this nice process, again, again, all part of methodology, that lets you decide what to do. We're going to do this project first because it's got the better ROI or net present value or whatever, you know, over the other ones. And there's these things at the bottom that you just never seem to get to. And a lot of times it's um, st stuff that would improve internal IT. Somebody's got to have the guts to just say, we're going to do this project because um, even though it doesn't shake out from a prioritization standpoint, 
We need to do it in order to get better. We need to take the time not just to put out the next widget or the next functional enhancement, whatever it is. We need to be able to get out there and do things better than we are. This is where the management's got to step up to it and, and break the rules. Um, we're, you're always under the gun. Somebody's got to have the guts to say, no, we're going to take the time out and we're going to actually think, think creatively on how to, how to handle this situation. Somebody's got to have the guts to say, you know, we're, we've, we're accumulating crap. We, it's time to cut that out and, and do it right. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. And that's why, that's why a lot of, there are only very few companies uh, mentioned, like in Forbes, for their top innovative companies. And, and there's only a couple, because only a couple have the guts to do it. Okay, good control. This is similar to methodology in that um, you, 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 make a, you make a commitment, it's going to be done on time, on budget, and it's done. Boom. People can count on you to do the right thing. Ah, it's not really true. They can count on you to do the thing that they ask you to do. But in particular, in, in the business where I'm in, in the, the mobile space and the internet space, a couple of you may uh, remember the phrase internet speed. Okay? That was to differentiate it from the way corporate America worked. It was faster. It was. I know. I lived it. I got news for you. Mobile. Putting ringtones on your phones, putting graphics on your phone. It's three times faster than internet speed. You really have to move fast. Time is your enemy. And it's also an enemy of innovation. Because you, every, you have to get it done in this amount of time. We only have this amount of time for analysis. We only have this amount of time for design because we've got to get it done. There is no opportunity in that kind of mode to be creative. We have the gun to your head. That's a problem. And you know, to do some self-analysis, that's what we found out. It, we, we had no, we stifled creativity. We stifled innovation in our, in our shop. So what do you do? There it is. You got to force it. Here again, somebody just says, we're going to take the time. Somebody has to have the guts to come up and say, we keep doing it like this. We're going to keep just getting marginal things. And that's not what's going to help the business grow. We're looking for that innovation. Remember back on an earlier slide? It's that epiphany. It's that leap. You can only get a leap if you have the ability to think in leaps and bounds. Force it. The parallel tracks, we had a project where we decided, OK, we're just going to put it on its normal track. And then we took another team and put them on a parallel track and said, beat them. Do it different. Okay, Take a little longer if you have to for some areas, but in the end, try to, try to meet this, um, try to be innovative. And we did. Took a lot of guts. Didn't really work. Ah, but that wasn't the point. The point was, it was one of our very earliest attempts to try to change our culture. Culture is one of the biggest problems in that's an inhibitor to, to innovation. Your bottom line, I don't, I don't know who here, it's the always meet, you got to meet the quarter, or the month, or the year. It's always meet something, 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 something. And innovation is not on that list of something that you got to meet. It takes a lot of guts to, to be innovative. The uncomfortables are, are like, uh, like Scott, but I have another example. Uh, I started a, a new group recently, 
And one of the things they did was go out and hire a young lady who, uh, from, a, from a, a whole persona, was my complete opposite. He said, why, Bruce, would you do that? Well, because I looked around to all the, all the other staff that I have, and I hired them all, and guess what? They all look like me. Not physically, thank goodness for them. They've got hair, I don't. Okay, but they, they pretty much are carbon copies of, of me from a, from a risk-taking standpoint. Because uh, they, they were under my direction for five, sometimes uh, 10 years. They, they are, uh, you know, unfortunately for them, uh, largely influenced by my style. So I said, rather than do uh, what came natural to me, I went out and hired a lady who's the complete opposite. This woman, she's like my wife. Okay? She spends money like you can't believe. She recently took a trip, um, and we have a policy at work where uh, if, if we go overseas, we'll pay for business class, but, but nobody does that, not even the CEO. He, we all travel in steerage because it saves money. Well, guess what? Not this lady. <laughs> okay. She went business class, uh, you know, and she's out there and just pushing things, and I listen to her ideas, and I, the first reaction I have is, why would you do this? Got to stop that. Guys, we need her. I need her. I need her perspective. You can't have everybody looking like me. You can't have everybody acting like me. It's because it stifles innovation. Okay, some examples. Because I told you some of the failures. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with failure uh, if it doesn't hurt you too badly. Actually, um, you know, if, if you read anything about innovation, uh, there, there really has to be a tolerance um, for, for what you might call failure. Not, that is, everything's not going to work. It just won't. You talk to people uh, like in Procter & Gamble, like one out of every 150 product, product ideas actually makes it to market. What p and is very good at is failing early so that it minimizes the cost investment. But for every product you see out there, and frankly, I don't, you know, I don't know why some of them work, there's, there's hundreds that, that don't work. You have to have this uh, tolerance for, quote, failure, that not everything's going to work. Uh, but here's, a, here's an example of where, in fact, we specifically at uh, uh, AG.com, one of our divisions, uh, d decided we needed to be innovative. So what you see up there is a typical day of bandwidth for our websites. So it, it's roughly 80 me megabits per second okay, um, at its peak. There was nothing going on. Now, uh, you should all go, wow, that's, that's a lot. 80 megabits a second, is that a lot to you? You don't think that's a lot? Where do you work? I work for Platinum Tell. We do a little bit more than that. Do, on a daily basis? Well, good for you. OK. That, that, normally, that, that impresses people that, that know that, that that's, that's hauling some big, big dollars. Yeah, hauling some big dollars. Well, okay, that's, uh, that's what it looks like on a normal day. Let me show you what it looks like on Valentine's Day. Okay. Now, that's impressive. I got an impressive thing, almost a gigabyte. Actually, that was 2003. 2004, uh, we were about 1.4 gigabytes per second. That's hauling some serious bandwidth, okay? And this is our, our life. Uh, at AG.com, we literally have an engineering cycle of 364 days. That is, after Valentine's Day, we have 364 days to prepare for the next Valentine's Day. And we do. Uh, for those of you who may have read, in, in Crane's Cleveland Business, uh, uh, the, the week uh, or after Valentine's Day, we had a nice article that showed that our site was up. Yeah. Okay, and Hallmark, 
those people who are unnamed in, in Kansas City, they were down. And they had to do a lot of damage control, and we were laughing our butts off. It was, it's a matter of pride on who can stay up. Well, this is uh, we, we, what we were faced with. And by the way, th things are uh, so crazy that all you can do, you can see how that ramps up in bandwidth. All you can do at that point is just hold on for the ride. Because at that point, even monitoring is turned off because it's invasive. Okay. I mean, we just, it, it's that tough. And we have 600 servers, by the way, in our server farm. And so either you did it right or you didn't. And see, you saw in 2003, there were some blips. Those, are, those were uh, actually gates that we put up uh, to redirect traffic. So even though um, it looks like there were some blips, they were planned, so we considered 2003 to be good. But we were sitting there. Um, Paying ourselves on the back that we, we made it through 2003 and started into the planning cycle for 2004. And this is what the business told us. Right? Great job, guys. Thank you very much. Store was open, took the money. Great year. Um, guess what for next year? Okay? We're going to triple the volume. Okay, anybody out there does capacity planning for their websites? Tripling your volume on a curve like that is enough to send you packing. And that's about the way we felt. Oh, and by the way, um, do it for less than a million dollars. Now, you say, well, that doesn't sound unreasonable. Well, the infrastructure that we had was uh, in the neighborhood of $12 million. Oh, and by the way, you have six months to do it. They didn't tell us the day after Valentine's Day. They told us somewhere in July. Well, you know, after getting over the initial shock, you know, we went through those uh, seven stages of dealing with uh, life crisis. You know, you know, we were in you know, denial. We were in denial, and then we, you know, so we, we got we got through those pretty quick. But we basically said. Doing what we did in the past ain't going to work. Duh. Right? At least we were smart enough to know that. So we, we said, we got a problem here. And we better figure out some ways to, to do this that are totally different from whatever we did before. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. We finally recognized that, you know, we had to do something different. Now, it took something like this to give us the wake-up call. And it's a very serious wake-up call. So what do we do? I'm trying to get this uh, microphone to bear with me a moment. Ah. OK. Still, uh, is it, can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you. OK. Um, Oh, well, we did this thing. Good thing we did was get, get rid of me. Right? Keep, keep the management at bay. Oh, you know. Oh, jeez. Bruce, stay out of it. Oh. You can tell how I reacted to that. Um, but it was a good move on their part. Again, I, I trained them. <laughs> they, were too, they know what I would do, and they knew that that was wrong or, or wouldn't be enough. So they said, Bruce, we'll just report back to you. That was hard. Hard for me to just let go, you know, and so, but I did, and it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but for the most part, they kept me on it. So then, then we did some unusual teams. You know, normally, well, you get one guy from the infrastructure group, and they do it, you know, and, and it's normally George, right, because he, he does this, and, and when we get our number one uh, guy for programming, uh, you know, put him on the team, and that's what we normally do. We said, nah. Because otherwise, we're going to end up with the same stuff. Those three always get together, and we have what we have. Got to stop that. We took people who really had no idea on what the infrastructure looked like and how it all fitted together. We put them on that team because they would ask the dumb questions. 
And we were hoping they'd have innovative solutions. And we, we decided to, to go to the outside, which we never do. I have this sh shirt in my office, okay? It says, vendors suck. And it's because vendors suck, okay? I, I just, uh, throughout my career, you know, have been burned by too many people that all they want to do is take my money and run and uh, use uh, whatever bonus they got for selling me that piece of crap to, to uh, go on a nice vacation to the point where we, we you know, we went right to open source um, uh, shop and we just didn't want to look at anybody else. But again, we, we had to break that rule in order to come up with some innovative things. You had to do things differently. Okay, okay. There's what we did. Page caching. We have a dynamic site uh, that you know uh, we use. This, we we have maybe um, six or seven base pages on our site that display thousands of different products. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's the same. You just dynamically feed it a parameter, right? It's product one, two, three instead of two, three, four, and it's smart enough to, to find out where everything is and displays it, right? So the, every page is dynamic. So, so somebody said, can't we cache it? I said, how can we cache it? It's, it's dynamic. Well, it turns out if you go out and ask that question to the right people, you will get the right answer. Well, the first people we asked were Oracle. Oracle had a really wonderful solution that, um, for, for caching pages, and uh, it just so happens that it, it very quickly was over that million dollars. Okay, so that was out. Um, but then but that got us thinking. It got us on a track that said, okay, this can be done. Because when, in fact, when you come to our site, and um, we don't know who you are, or if you're like a first time visitor, or we just don't know, don't know anything about you, and you, you come to uh, bluemountain.com, you get the same page as he does. And an hour later, you get the same page. It's the same page, it, you know, at least when you start out. Well, well, well there ought to be a way to, to, to cache that somehow. Turns out there is. We had uh, lengthy uh, meetings, design meetings with Akamai. And uh, through uh, some very innovative things, they just didn't think it could be done, we ended up making changes to our application such that it, we could turn a switch at the server level and cache um, most of the pages. In fact, we were able to cache 70% of the pages on our site. Wow, 70%, 70%. Guys, 70%, that's like buying back you know, a, a threefold increase in capacity. Hey, now that's innovation. And again, Akamai, they didn't think it could be done. Our people, Python people, by the way, uh, you know, figured it out. Unfortunately, without my, without my help, uh, you know, but they did it. And de oracleizing ah. Okay, this was, uh, this was uh, an idea. Uh, by one of our staff who, uh, in a former life, had done some work with MySQL. We said, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's open source and, you know, it's not good. And he says, well, you know, let's just think. He says, aren't there parts of a, you know, aren't there, and by the way, if, if you know uh, MySQL, it's a great package. And in fact, for read-only applications, it's faster than Oracle. Oracle may not think so, but try it. So, okay, it's faster for read-only. Ah, is there part of our application that is read-only? Why, golly, there is. There really is. In fact, most of the work that's done is retrieval. For every uh, person that, that sends a card, we serve on the average of eight pages that are just retrieving data that builds a page. Oh, golly. MySQL does retrieval faster than Oracle, and it's free. How cool is that? Our DBAs, by the way, who are, were, notice the word were, 
Oracle DBAs didn't believe it. But boy, we ran benchmarks. My golly, we, now our Oracle DBAs are Oracle and MySQL DBAs. Okay? Load testing. Ah, here's, here's one of the reasons I had my shirt is because over the years, we bought um, two load testing software packages, paid for them, and they were for crap. They all, they couldn't do the volumes that we did. Even if, even if they could, we could never get them to reproduce uh, a set of scripts that mirrored our um, environment reliably. And so, you know, that's where my shirt came in. Fender suck. So, you know, Bruce, when I heard that they were going to go out and get load testing software to identify bottlenecks, my first reaction was, what are you, you nuts? Of course, I went, <laughs> and they did. They went out and bought it. And much to my surprise, they found bottlenecks. One of the more interesting bottlenecks was that it turns out that when you run servers in a rack, you can relate to this because you have a lot of servers, right? You, you fill servers in a rack, right? Or, you, you know, you, can, you, you only get, you, you know, let's see, about 22 U's to a rack or, 10, or 21 U's. I mean, because of the heat. It's all about heat. Um, and we're, we're out of the third party. So they have very restrictions on the, the density of stuff. Well, what we found out much to our dismay is that if you run the servers, hot. I meant hot in the sense that you're running maximum load, right? Versus, which you get at that peak versus the little stuff. You, it draws more power. Now, that's nowhere in any of the specs. Nowhere. That when you run this puppy to its max, it draws more power. And we blew the circuits <laughs> in, the, in the rack. And and we were melting things because of the heat. And it's like, oh, crap. Better to, better to find out now than on the four, 14th when all you can do is watch it melt. They found that. And they found a couple other bottlenecks as well. Incredible. And uh, program optimization, you know, we, we had pe here again, we had people that didn't write the code, look at the code. And it was tough because the guy who wrote the code was very proud of it, if you can believe that. I was trying to explain to my daughters, who are, neither of them are in IT, that there's a rule in IT. Every programmer thinks every other programmer's code is crap. Okay? So for him to give it up to somebody that never saw it before was hard. We told him, shut up anyway and do it. And guess what? They found ways to make that thing much more efficient. Just another set of eyes. But somebody that had no credibility, not that you don't, uh, you know, in that area. But we needed that different perspective. Last one, asynchronous processing, the one that uh, is a good example of why you send people out to, to conferences. We had a guy go out to a conference, and one of the presenters was um, with a company that was trying to help the IRS. I, who would want to help the IRS? Well, if they paid you, you would, right? <laughs> So here's our problem. They were trying to encourage the submission of tax returns electronically. Well, remember my graph about the, 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 the peak on the 14th of February? Guess what it looks like for the IRS on April 14th? The same thing. This guy had the same problem. So here's one of my staff out in the audience going, <laughs> At least I'm not alone. But this guy had an answer. This guy had an answer. He says, you know, we don't have to do all the processing when we get a submission. Because the way they had designed a system, when you, when you submit it, it had to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things in order to log it in properly and, and make sure everything is there. Well, this guy said, no, we, we don't have to do that. In fact, the only thing we have to do is say, we got it. And put it somewhere where we know where it is. And we can get it 
later. Hence the, the asynchronous component. This guy figured out, no, break the rules. We don't have to do all those 10 things. We just got to catch it and put it somewhere where we know where it is. Well, guy comes back and says, what about greeting cards? When people are sending greeting cards, because what happens on the 14th is a combination of things. Um, people, we have queued up um, millions of cards that are being held to be delivered on the 14th. And then we blow it out there, and all those people come, but a lot of times people are coming at the last minute. That's the problem with the, you know, it's the good news and the bad news about the internet. It, you can come at the last minute and send a, an e-card to your significant other or others, okay, and, and have it get there automatically. How do they know that you, you just, duh, you know, you wait until the last minute? They never know whether it was last minute. So they do, they come, but you know what? They don't, you don't have to turn around and deliver it in the next 30 seconds like we do every other day. If you held it for hmm, five minutes, 10 minutes, hmm, maybe even an hour, how are they going to know? They, in fact, they don't. You'd never know. So he said, aha, why don't we do asynchronous processing of cards that, that want to be sent? And that's why that's up there. All that taken together, uh, we spent less than that million dollars. We got it less, done in less than six months. And best of all, on both 2004 and 2005, it was like that uh, MasterCard thing, flawless. Okay. It was, and all because we were forced to be innovative. We were forced into it. If it wasn't for the fact that we had those constraints that were totally unreasonable, we probably would have never done that and never learned the fact that ordinary course of business, we don't care about innovation. But we also learned that under stress, we could rise to the occasion. And that was a very important lesson. Very important lesson. Okay. So, like I told you, we didn't do everything right. Got plenty of stories, especially on the not doing it right thing. So I got this group that reports to me, called the product database. I mean, when you're in the when you're in a in a business where your um, your goods are electronic, you know, our inventory is electronic, you know. Um, your product database ought to be the most important thing to you in the whole wide world. Yeah, okay. Um, it turns out it's, a, it's one of those uh, shoemaker's children, it's a stepchild. But to me, it's one of the most fertile grounds we have for innovation. Part of what they, this group does is support the people who make our product. Hopefully, now see, you've got mostly, mostly in the audience are men. How many people have sent an e-card e here in the last year? Come on, come on, don't be ashamed. Okay, actually, it's, it, you guys are better than most. Um, guys, um, I, I don't know, for the lady in the audience here, um, I don't know how to break this to you, but guys are typically insensitive slobs, okay? Even though e-greetings allows you to, to be idiotically simple to send a greeting card, they in fact don't. 70% uh, of our um, traffic is from women. Okay, but um, we do some nice cards, I think. Uh, you know, I'll put my plug in for our sites. Now, if you like a little edgier, go to egreetings.com or Blue Mountain. Some really good stuff. We have some really creative people. Okay, uh, and a lot of it's flash. And part of what my group does is help support these people. And I've said to them, I said, look, guys, um, there is just this wealth of opportunity out there. Uh, people are... Uh, have flash development forums. And, and they're very proud of their special effects that they put, and they put them out there for people to use. Um, I want you guys to take two hours a week, two hours a week, and all I want you to do is go out and surf. Look for stuff to steal. Steal shamelessly. Why not? Heck, it's out there. They're giving it to you. Go grab it. And I said, this is part of your performance, right? Your performance review. So 
we do this twice a year. We sit down, we say, did you do what we said? Yeah, yeah. How well did you do it? All that kind of stuff. I said, this is going to be on your performance reviews. So six months later, I come back to the, to the manager. And I said, OK, tell me what we did with those two hours every week. He said, well, we didn't, we didn't do too much. I said, what do you mean you didn't do too much? Well, I, well, the bottom line is they never did the two hours. Why? Because they were always trying to get that next thing out. Boy, if we don't get this out, we've got to get it out for Mother's Day. And Mother's Day just doesn't move. So I think about holidays. You know, a lot of times, you, you know, you work under things. Well, it doesn't matter if, it, if you miss a month. Well, if you miss a month for something related to Mother's Day, you miss a year. Calendar is pretty unforgiving. So it was always, well, if it wasn't Mother's Day, it was Father's Day. If it wasn't Father's Day, it was Halloween. And it just never ended. They never got to it. So at the end, it's like you got a zero for that, man. And why? It's because it just, we failed. It's, it wasn't part of our anatomy. Now, how, what, a, what a sad thing that is, OK? That you can't take two hours a week out of somebody's time to just let them go. And, and they just, you know, we failed. And this gets, gets into, you know, innovation. If, uh, you know, why, why innovation fails? Why aren't companies innovative? Why aren't there more co people fighting to be the number one, two, three, four, five in Business Week or Forbes or whatever and from innovation? It's because it's not part of the, the genetic makeup or the anatomy of a company, particularly one that's always focused on meeting the month, meeting the quarter, making the year, okay? And that was our problem. Another failure. Okay. So here's another thing. Uh, this is really applicable to um, more of the managers. But um, one of the comments I got was uh, from the CEO is, that, how come, how come your, your data warehouse group isn't telling us where to, to, um, how to get sales up? Okay. Um, how come, how come your IT is is not coming up with a new uh, product offering on the cell phone? We don't see you guys doing this. You should be leading us to the promised land because we're in, you know our business is largely technology. How come you're not doing this? And it's like, gee. I'm supposed to do this? But I found myself in a situation of, trying, of having to, to really defend myself. You know, where, where well, the other thing he was asking is, where is your, where is your leadership in, in, in innovation as, as IT? Because you're, you're fundamental to our business. It's a great thing about uh, my business. In fact, uh, the CEO's right. What a they, they can't do anything without me. They think they're a marketing company. Ha ha, they're wrong. Okay, they think they're an e-greeting card company. Ha ha, they're wrong. They're a technology company. They're a software company. Because what we really sell is electronic. We sell it through software. It happens to be through the web. They can't do anything without me. That's a great position to be in. They need me. But they're looking for direction. And that's a tough thing. Um, anybody who's ever in, in that position really needs to, to take some <laughs> best defenses and offense. But um, try to partner. You can't do it alone. They, they can't do it without you, but you can't do it without them. And that's a tough point to get across. Um, where this line is between the leadership of IT versus the business. And it's the reason a lot of CIOs and CTOs don't make it because they can't work this out. But it's all part of the corporate um, culture. Do, are they serious about innovation? So what can you do? And I get this, um, 
This is meant to be applicable to anybody here, okay? Whether you're an individual or a manager or what, okay? Um, we talked about uh, people. You as, a, you as a person, as an individual, you should be trying to be that person with that different perspective. Fight for that training, fight for that, that trip to uh, that conference, get you out there. Fight for the time, those two hours a week, to do that surfing, to become familiar with the message boards. There's other people out there doing stuff, steal shamelessly. But it's also processes and values. Um, one of the debates I had was I said, you know, when we do this performance evaluation, we, we, we say, oh, are you a team player? Oh, okay, a little check mark there for team player. Do you communicate well? Oh, yeah. So is one of those things innovation? No, it's not. It's not. We don't grade people on innovation. If, you know, if they don't grade you on it, it must not be important enough to put in our value system. Our processes, you know, do they allow for time for people to think creatively, innovatively? If they don't, how can you expect to be innovative? You'll never be innovative without that. All these things need to be open to innovation as part of what your genetic uh, uh, material of your company is. If they're not, you, you can expect not to get that education, not to get the opportunity, and, and you, eventually the company is the one that's going to suffer. Don't let, don't let the company suffer, and don't let yourself suffer as an individual. You've got to be asking for these things. So just to tell you what we're doing uh, in terms of trying to make innovation part of our company. And, and, and there are the steps up there for you to read. And this, don't, this is tough. This is, this is really tough. There's a book out, I think I mentioned it in a slide or two, called The Innovator's Dilemma. Anybody ever read that by Clay Christensen? It's a great book. Basically says, look, you know, the, the problem is just what I've been trying to say all the time. You've got to meet the, meet the quarter, meet the month, meet the whatever, and um, it doesn't allow for innovation. And that's a problem. It'll kill you. It'll kill you. And he, the book is full of examples um, about what happens. He talks about the, the mini mills, the mini steel mills, where uh, they basically uh, take uh, and reprocess old steel, right, versus the integrated mills that start with the pellets. Well, uh, his example is where they, they started at the bottom of the quality thing, and um, the reaction by the the company, uh, the U.S. Steels was, oh, I'll let them go. They can have the, the bottom of the barrel. But what ended up happening is now, you know, the people that uh, make the mini mills are buying the people who were the integrated ones because they, they made all the money. In our own business, um, American Greetings and Hallmark, too, uh, for the longest time, we kept raising prices to where if you buy cards, and I know you guys don't because you're guys, okay, by the way, 95% of cards are bought by women, so don't feel ashamed. You're not alone. Okay, but they gradually took the average price for a, car, for, for a card from $2 to 350 you know, and were sitting on enjoying the, the, the money rolling in. Well, what happened was technology came along, and uh, where it used to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to buy presses and, and get paper and, and ink and all this stuff to make greeting cards, Technology uh, dropped the price of a, of a really good quality press to a half a million dollars. Well, ended up happening, you ever hear of the dollar card stores? That's how they do it. They don't have the cost structure that AG has, has inherited and maintained. And they don't have all the overhead. So they can offer a card for a buck and make a, make a good uh, a profit on it when we can't. And we were caught, and, and the, when it came out, uh, AG said, oh, that's not going to catch on. Who wants to buy a dollar card? Turns out, guess what? Lots of people want to buy dollar cards because they're sick and tired of paying 350 Again, you guys wouldn't know. You're guys. You don't buy cards. And when you do, you don't care because it's, you know, it's, it's Valentine's Day and you just got to buy it anyway. But a lot of people care. 
So now they're all looking at their cost, AEG's look, and Hallmark too, looking at their cost structure. We have to find a way to offer a dollar card and make a profit on it. And that's going to take innovation. Anyway, this is, um, this is what we're, we're trying to, this is hard. This is hard. The, the, again, the book, the book tells you why it's hard, and believe me, it is. We're, we're not making a lot of progress on this. This was a plan that uh, I put together in November. Here it is, April. And I got to tell you, we're still struggling to do this. That's five months. We have very little to show for it. Again, it's hard. We, we're trying to do this with uh, uh, the head of the European Mobile Group. Well, he's got his own troubles. What do you want to do, John? Don't talk to me now, I'm busy, you know? How about you, Brian? What do you want to do in California for the US Mobile Group? Don't bother me, I'm busy, you know? How can you do innovation when everybody's, so we're struggling. It's tough, it really is. All these things uh, we, we've tried and avoiding dashing people's hopes and dreams. You know, we, we got together this group of creative people and said, gee, brainstorm, what can we do, what can we do? We came up with this idea list and we said we're not going to disappoint them. When they give us it, we're going we're to give it serious consideration and we're going to do something. And we haven't. And those people aren't going aren't, to aren't come back. With, and they're very creative people. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that one. That, that's just uh, making the point that um, maybe if you're lucky, there, there's some place in your company, if you're in a larger company, that has some sort of group that's doing the innovation. Now, if there is, you want to piggyback on it. What I'm going to show you is the process that our AG corporate group is actually trying to in install uh, at corporate to build this pipeline of ideas. There it is. It's a great thing about working for like a card company. They very colorful things, you know, and they're very creative when it comes to it. I mean, look at that. Get the story. Get the idea. Get it started. Get you know. Get makes you want to just get going, right? I mean, clever. I mean, I didn't have to create that. So this is what they're doing. They have this process that, that allows people to submit ideas, and it goes through these these gates, much like the, you know we talked about Procter and Gamble, right? In order to come out with good products, you got to at the end you got to start with a lot of ideas and filter them down, right? That, you got to do that. You can't expect everyone to be a winner. It just isn't going to happen. Fail often, but fail early. So this is their process that they've got. And so we, remember I told you about stealing shamelessly? We stole that. So we're trying to do that too. But you know, you can, you can steal this one. But hopefully you're in a company that's got one like this. If you don't, that's a warning sign. Tell them they ought to have one. Otherwise you're gonna be like AG, tell them about the dollar stores. Do you wanna be like AG in the dollar stores? No, you don't. You wanna be the dollar store guy. Those are the guys that, that were being innovative. They figured it out. The, the technology dropped that cost of entry, boom. Be the dollar store guy. Okay. So, um, it's easy to, to get started. And again, whether you're an individual, you're a manager, you're running your own company, there's stuff out there. If you want to go out to Amazon and type in innovation, Okay, you, you get like, I don't know, maybe somebody can do it when you're online. Somebody do that for me. Who, can you volunteer? Can, can, you, can you get on Amazon, search, type in the word innovation, tell me how many titles come back. So while he's doing that, these are three of my favorite books. Um, and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really good. You know, part of it is just seeing, somebody, somebody's already tackled this, so, or thought it through, and probably much better than you or I can, so I'll steal. It's a great, great reading, easy reading, um, and, and I think some, some great points. Uh, they're eye-openers, because I read this book, The Innovator Solution. It was given to me by a young lady who's an entrepreneur here in town, and I put it on my shelf for about a year. And then one day I got around to reading, and I'm going, oh, crap, I should have read this a year ago. I gave it to my boss. My boss goes, oh, geez, this is us. 
we're going we're gonna to go the, the same route that, uh, that, that, that the steel mills went because we could see it was a problem. So he takes it and he gives it to corporate. Well, three months later, at a management meeting, uh, we had Clay Christensen come in. We paid this guy a speaker's fee of some unheard of amount. And he came in and he spoke to the entire senior AG corporate team about this. It was a wake-up call to the whole company. Wow. Sort of like that guy we sent out about, you know, that saw the IRS thing. You know, what a series of events. So just by that lady giving me this book, you know, we had this guy in and we started all these programs. It's a wake-up call. It's, and it, sometimes it's very humbling that you're, you're in danger of becoming like the, uh, the steel mills. How many did you get? 11,580. 11,000 plus, okay? So there's pl plenty of books out there, obviously fertile ground. A lot of people are thinking about this and you can get as many ideas um, that you want. By the way, the, the weird ideas that work, they're the ones that have the, the people that you don't like. Get the people that make you feel uncomfortable. That's one of the, the quotes from there. Get that, get that Scott, get that person that, uh, that, that makes you feel uncomfortable. Here's two good websites. Um, you can spend all, you know, I, I used to get the weekly uh, emails, but then I fell into that two hours a, a week. I couldn't, couldn't keep up. They're, they, they, they're just generating ideas all the time. White papers, free, um, great advice on, you know, structure, either at the individual level or, or for companies and how you build innovation into your company. It's out there. It's yours for the taking. Nobody does it, or very few people do. And the reason is, you gotta meet the month, you gotta meet the quarter, you gotta meet the year. We don't have any budget, yada, 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 okay? It, it, it's reality today, but the sad part of that reality is that it's killing the creativity. It's killing it. The people that I, I see the most creative, I, mean, I think I may have a slide on this. Um, I think I do, hang on. Ah, part of what I stole just this last week from, from one of those websites was this innovation DNA. Oh, how cool. You know, somebody puts it in a framework like that. And he talks about all this stuff. Leadership, you know, again, it's a nice structure. And the whole point of it, you just keep going out there and you keep finding stuff and steal it. Steal it. Ah, I love these guys. Anybody familiar with Nottingham and Spurk? They're local? Oh, you are? Yeah. Yes. There. You've done work there? No, uh, my best friend works there. Oh, okay. Um, wonderful place. It's here in town. Okay? They, um, they had a building on, what, Bellflower? Um, okay, and, and they're, yeah, so they're, they're in town. They're these two guys, wonderful guys. John, John Nottingham and John Spur. But, strangely enough. And they're like two artists that graduated from Cleveland School of Art and figured out they had to make a living. Oh, how sad was that, right? So, not as artists, but they, they, they are basically a, an idea firm. Idea firm, oh, how cool is that? And they're very successful, and they're wonderful gentlemen um, to meet and, and speak with. But one of the things they early had was the spin pop. Now, uh, what two, how two artists came up with the spin pop, I have no idea, but they basically figured it out by, um, that they could go out to China and for pennies come up with this uh, assembly that allowed them to uh, rotate something and, with a battery and they put a lollipop on it and they sold it and sold millions. Millions. Now, what a great thing. It had nothing that ever suggested that would be a, uh, an area uh, of interest to kids. It was novel. And so they made a lot of money. So they're sitting around one day going, okay, we have mastered the art of outsourcing little mechanical uh, projects to China for pennies. <coughs> and basically, the spin pop allowed you to, to spin. You know. So what can we do with that? Well, that, that's the next slide here. Uh, next, next slide I'm here. It's, anybody have one of these uh, Crest toothbrushes? Hey, I got one. I got one. The, the, the market, when they entered the market for electric toothbrushes was three million units a year. 
If, if, and, and no one would ever want to enter it, a market like that. There are already five or six competitors. What, who, who would want another electric toothbrush, by the way? Well, these guys said, well, we got the spin pop. We can add another gear to it, and, and it'll make a toothbrush. Well, how, okay, well, why do we want to do that? Well, we could sell it for $5. Well, most electric toothbrushes are like $25 or something like that. These guys, you know, did it on their own, did it for um, two years on their own, finally sold it to Procter & Gamble for like $400 million, all because of a spin pop, all because they sat around, took some time, and said, what can we do with something that goes like this? Something that goes like this. And they came up with the toothbrush. It's a great thing. The last thing on here is something even, I think, is even cooler. Remember the story about the, um, the Christmas tree? By the way, Nottingham and Spurk designed that. They also designed this. Anybody you buy the Dutch Boy thing? Anybody? OK, here's the story. Um, a couple of years ago, Sherwin Williams had a, a new CEO. And they're talking about you know, their, their positioning in the marketplace, uh, yada, yada. So um, the, the two guys from Nottingham and Spurk come in and say, uh, and give them a demonstration. Uh, how they got his ear, I don't know, but they got an audience with this guy. And they said, they, should, they, they showed this guy, look what people have to go through to use your product. And, and, they, and they brought out a paint can. Now, everybody here has probably used, you know, painted, right? It's a mess. You can never find that, that hickey that they give you, you know, with, that, that helps you open a can. So what do you do? You get a butter knife or a screwdriver or something like that. And then, then you, you, you finally get it, and it's a mess, and you get the lid. And you don't know, you know what to do with the lid, right? Um, and then uh, it's just, and you're pouring it. I, I've got this little plastic thing you put on it, but is it, you know, it, it helps. It's still, it's a mess. It's just a freaking mess, you know. It, you know, it, nobody likes the paint because of the paint. It's, you know, so these guys said, you, you really don't, you, you know, you have to look at it from your customer's perspective and understand why, why it's just not a pleasant experience. And, and by the way, we have an answer. See, they're not dumb. They, they, you know, you, you shouldn't go into a manager you know, with a problem unless you have an answer for them. So they did. They had an answer. And it was a prototype of what you see here. This thing has got 15 patents on it. 15 patents. Nottingham and Spurk has a goal. They have a goal to have more patents than uh, Edison. That's their goal. In their, in their offices, they have a... They have this tally of here's Edison, you know, 1,000 plus patents, and here's where they're at. They're at 600 and some. They're going to beat them. That's their goal, have more patents than Edison. I think they'll do it. This thing is so cool. Got a handle rather than a handle this way. It's a handle because it, you can pour it. A woman can pour it. That's the other thing. They said what they want to do, how to open up the market, is women should women want to be creative and, and do this stuff, but they don't because it's messy and it's ooky and you know they they just rather have the guy get dirty. Okay? They have a handle on it, you pour it. And part when you open that up, by the way, you don't need any tool to open this up. It's a twist on. And it's got two things on it, so a woman can do it with average strength. And when you open it up it's got a spout that comes out and it folds back in. How cool is that? I mean, and it turns out that, um, so, so from the customer standpoint, this solves a whole lot of problems. It turns out that paint cans have a 20% return because they get dinged somewhere in the process of handling. And, and if you're like me, you don't buy a paint can that's got a, a dent in it. You just don't. Just, Oh, why? The next one next to it's got so it's a twenty percent return. Guess what? If you if you bang this around, it doesn't get dented. 
So can you imagine uh, from Sherwin Williams getting 20% more, you know, getting rid of 20% of returns because they don't dent? How cool is that? What a great idea. These guys are just amazing. You, you want help in being innovative. These guys are a great sort. They're right in town. They're real expensive, but they're right in town. They do believe in Cleveland. They're, they're staying here. I have Google envy. I have Google envy. Uh, you know, every time I go to their site, there's, they have this new tab. There's something new there. I mean, since they went public, they, they've come out with, you know, the language translator, the maps. I mean, it seems like it doesn't stop. And, you, know, you know, off the home page is a link to the lab section, the stuff that's coming. My goodness, is, and, and that's just what they're showing to the public. You know that back there, they, they've got the next two, three, four, five things they're working on. These guys are incredible. They have this engine, this wonderful engine. You know, what can we do with it? Well, I guarantee you that they've got the time to sit down there and to think that through. They have the time to, to do that because it's evident in what they do. Who's got the desktop, the Google desktop? Okay, how cool is that? Oh, it's just, well, why would we want to do that? That's just like Microsoft Search. Hell it is. No way it's the same. Okay, it's a great thing. It's, you know, they're thinking. The maps. Why would you do maps when there's, when there's a MapQuest and Yahoo Maps and all that stuff? Because I can do it better. And they did. They think it through. They have a culture. I'm guessing. I haven't had the, the luxury of getting to know these fellows. I'd love to do it. Of, of that, that encourages thinking like this. It's innovation. What can we do with this stuff? How do we do it? I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's part of the way they work. That's the kind of thing that if, you know, and they have the, and they didn't have that, you know, it's not like they were um, bringing in a whole lot of money early on, right? They struggled. They struggled right through. They stuck with their pride. They believed in their product. Okay? They had all sorts of competitors out there. They thought they had the best. They stuck with it. And this is the result. I have Google Envy. Google Envy. So, okay. We're getting close close to the end. You guys have been very patient. Thank you. So what, this is kind of the summary. You, you need to take away something. Petro's been up here for almost an hour and a half, been babbling around. I told you, if you let me talk, I will, and I have. So time to get some takeaways. Make it worth your while for sitting here, giving up part of your afternoon. This is really your wake-up call. Remember I told you it took us um, that, that perfect storm project um, to, to, to let us know we had a problem. Not only as a company, but even as an individual level. Okay, personally, I have uh, you know done some things that um, you know you could say for myself. I like to think the company will benefit as well. But uh, yeah, I went out and fought for some things, um, and I got them, and I'm, hopefully it's going to pay off. But this is you know you, I hope out of all this you, you're sensitized to you know this innovation thing. It's real. Okay, if you're in a company that it's not real, then you better start asking why it's not. So this is your wake-up call, your call to action as an individual, and if you're in any kind of management position, um, as a manager, to take some of these steps. Um, figure out, do something, man. And I don't, I don't, I don't care what it is. And it's going to be different for you, or you, or you. That's okay. But by golly, do something for either yourself and the company after you leave here. Think about this. I've given you all the roadmaps and the, and the hints that it's easy. And go back to Amazon, right? Plenty of books there. You can start with IT. IT is great. You're in this business because you are creative people. It's a cool business, OK? Um, there isn't, isn't a, a greater opportunity to put yourself into a product on a continuing basis that I can think of. You know, I got, I got the uh, invitation from my 
undergraduate for the 30th year reunion, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it couldn't have been that many years. Um, but in fact, um, it's been a great 30 years. Um, and it's even a greater time now for you to be out there and being part of IT. You can be innovative in IT, have the opportunity to make a difference more than anybody else. It's a great place. I, <laughs> neither of my daughters I can convince of that because they see the hours I put in, but it's because I love it. And I'm sure you guys do too. And it's, this is this whole thing, uh, the last thing about a journey rather than a destination, it is. It's not, it's not easy. You can see I've failed several times trying to put innovation either into a group or a company. It's not easy. But, but think of it as a, a, a journey, not something that you do, you do just once. Okay, so for those of you who have been observant through all this time, you, you should know by now that I'm uh, somewhat of a fan of Mr. Da Vinci. Okay, we've, all along we've been showing some of his drawings and things, a great creative guy, and, and, and uh, how many of you read the Da Vinci Code? Okay, a couple, a great, great easy read book. But, um, so, um, if you've been real attentive, you've been noticing all along the bottom of each slide are a series of roses. And so, in fact, it is a code. And for anybody, and, and you know, uh, Paul's got the uh, presentation up, up on the web, so you can grab it. And so anybody who can break the code and email me the answer on what it is, I will get you a, a year's free subscription to any one of our sites, eGreetings, Blue Mountain, or American Greetings. And um, so there's a summary of all the pages. And I'm, since I'm a nice guy, I'm going to give you a hint. And that's the hint. Ask key code questions. And even another hint, I've given you the first answer. So uh, that's out there on the web. I don't think anybody had memorized it. And with that, that is the end. And I'd be willing to take questions, especially if someone could get me a glass of water. Yes, sir. You talked about uh, sending your guys out into the world to PyCon and having them surf the web a few hours a week and things like that a lot and see what other people have done and steal what you can and put it to new, new right. and innovative uses. Um, do you guys do much in the way of contributing back so that other people can say, hey, they did something really innovative. Let's see if we can uh, try to be as cool as that. Okay. The question was, since uh, one of Bruce's uh, uh, Petroisms is to steal shamelessly. What am I doing to, you know, further enhance the art, if you will? Um, very little, um, and other than going on the road like this, um, trying to participate. Seriously, we we do we do have people that are active in the uh, the Linux community. Um, in fact, I just gave one of our uh, staff members the okay to publish um, into an open forum one of our uh, products uh, that he'd been working on. This has to do with uh, configuration management. Uh, I can't remember the name of the tool, but it's, there's an open source engine out there that he made additions to, so we did publish that. Another one of our staff is very active in Linux. We encourage him to publish. Uh, we are getting active in the Python. So I, I, you know, quite seriously, we are doing a little bit of that, and uh, it's only recently I think we have something to, worthwhile, and so we are um, making it a point to, in fact, contribute. Uh, yes, sir. You're looking into doing uh, e-greetings via cell phones, correct? I'm sorry, what was it? You're looking to doing greeting cards via cell phones. Yes. Correct? Can I give you some advice? Uh, sure. Start with Sprint. Uh, okay. Um, the, the, the question was, well, am I looking to put uh, green cards on cell phones? I said yes. His recommendation was start with Sprint. Um, are you familiar with 3G Upload? Yes. Okay. 3G Upload, I know the guys there that actually started that business. Great group of guys. Um, they run um, an interesting site, 3GUpload.com. Uh, 
they push product uh, to most phones. Um, we, uh, I love those guys and I have a lot of admiration. Uh, we uh, are actually working with Sprint uh, more through a front door rather than a back door. Uh, those guys actually hacked in and don't share any revenue with Sprint, uh, which is okay. I mean, you don't have to because the hack is, op is, is somewhat well known. Uh, being a Fortune 500 uh, company, um, we, we don't operate like that. But we, we actually have uh, graphics on Sprint. Um, so we're, we're, we're going through the front door rather than the back door. But, but thank you. Yes, sir, you had a question. On the uh, question of what do you give back, don't forget your contribution is being stolen from. Is being what? Yours, uh, other people stealing from yours, oh. the way you do from theirs. Well, I, I say stealing in a, in a um, tongue in cheek. You, yeah. you have to understand. Um, I, I, there, there are a lot of, I'm, I'm an open source, uh, I wouldn't say fanatic, but uh, very much in favor of it. And part of that is giving back um, and contributing to it. And, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're very much in tune with that, very much so. Yes, sir, question. What, uh, with only Nightmare with men not buying greeting cards, or only 10% of us, what innovation opportunities are there to change that? Okay, the question or statement was, you know, Bruce, geez, the men are insensitive clods, uh, don't buy a lot of greeting cards. Uh, what opportunities are there from an innovation standpoint to, to capture them? Uh, you know, I, I would love to have you come back to the office with me uh, because uh, I'm uh, the lone voice in the wilderness saying that this can be cracked. And, I, you know, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the decision has been made to um, take advantage of the fact that women do and to not ignore the men but put them on a second priority since it seems to be a second priority for men. Um, so this is an interesting debate that I have with the people that run the websites who by the way are all, all ladies. Um, seems that the men t tend to do the technology and the women tend to do the marketing. So uh, I believe there are ways to do it um, at the moment, we're not pursuing them uh, as, as a company. And it leaves the door open for some innovative person to do that. And I've made that, made that very point. Okay? One of the things you'll learn in, in Christensen's book on uh, his advice for innovation is find people that have a need that are underserved, that, that's, that their needs are not being um, met. I've told the lady running it, I says, the reason you can't, uh, you don't agree with me is because, um, you know, no disrespect, you're not a guy. Okay? I know what it would take, and I gave her examples of what it would be um, to be idiot proof for a guy for a green card site. But <clears throat> that is, is a problem, and it's an opportunity for somebody who's innovative to say, I know how to get to guys. Because guys only like two things, okay? They, they, if it's not sexy or funny, that's the one category, or I gotta do something nice because it's Valentine's Day. That's the only two things we care about, okay? And we're really easy, I tell them. We're, we're really easy to figure out. <laughs> There's only, only two modes we operate in. Beer and naked women, or we gotta give a nice card. I mean, either way, you know, so. Uh, it's it's an, it's in whatever that is for us. Again, uh, again, Christensen says it's underserved. That's 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 your growth. Look for a market that's underserved. It's not being served well, and and that's where you get growth. More questions. More questions. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Yeah, I have have one more here. The question was, Bruce, you, oh man, you got 600 servers. Are they all in one spot or did you um, split them apart? Well, the answer is they're all in one spot. Um, the reason that we used to have them in two spots, but uh, back when the bubble burst, uh, uh, 
in addition to five rounds of layoffs and cutting everything to bone, we went to one. So things are better now. Why are we still in one spot? Well, um, it's a good spot. Uh, that nothing short of a, a direct hit with a, a, a real powerful missile is going to take out our uh, our data center. Uh, and in the f in the five years we've been there, uh, they've only had one problem for 30 minutes, and that's because they were that's a human error rather than anything else. So um, our view is that. Um, uh, for the price to make it redundant somewhere, it's, it's, it's at this point not worth it. Although we are looking at that again, and interesting you bring that up because the challenge for that project about how to economically split our farm is, is a project that we have for 2005, and we're going to be innovative in our solutions for that. That's the only way we're going to do it. But we currently have it all in one spot. And I can tell you where. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned your data center was only was only been down for thirty minutes. Was that when they did the load testing? Oh no, I'm talking the facility itself. I'm, I'm just joking with you. The, the facility itself. Earlier in your in your oh. presentation, you were talking about your your group of people buying load testing software. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the blade servers and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Well, we. Um, you know, during the load testing, we, uh, you know, uh, when we, as soon as that happened, we tripped some other things, and we were okay. Nobody ever knew. Okay, we we do our load testing at uh, like two thirty, three thirty at night. Not a lot of people sending greeting cards, as you can imagine, uh, even on West Coast time with a delay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We do have a question. See, I was just hoping that you you were you were even paying attention here. You had. No, I, I wanted to. Uh, that's kind of a little different, but as the the CTO for the company, I was wondering the kind of the management style that you found that worked within, or any of the management styles that were used with the other. I don't know how uh, the structure within your department goes, but just the styles that are used, and whether it's more of a hands-on type of approach, a. Uh, I don't know, encouragement, how it goes, and how the other managers might react to the different people in the department, how they interact, how it's used. I mean, I've heard a, a few things about, especially in the CTO position, whether or not you would even, say, want somebody who's technically inclined in that kind of a position, because they might think too technically for such an executive position. Mm -hmm. But I, mean, I was just wondering about your experience in the matter and how those kind of things play into your turn. Okay, this doesn't have too much to do with innovation, but I'll take I'll take it anyway. The question was, you know, as a CTO, you know, what kind of style do you have, and what's your experience in style? And um, I'll be honest with you, the, the CTO position is it was created in January of 2004, so I'm I'm fairly new to this, and our company is fairly new to it. The reason the CTO position was uh, instituted is because we went from one a company with just basically one product line which was eGreetings, to a company that has four. And in each of our divisions, the dot-com being one of them, uh, we have an independent group of IT people. So I went from being the CIO of a single product company to a CTO that's got four divisions reporting to us. Um, <clears throat> his question was, uh, you know, do, do they want a technical person there, or do they really want a business person because it's at that high level? Um, our total company is only about uh, 270 people, so it's not like our corporate brethren where they have several tens of thousands, uh, and, their, and their IT group is 350. Um, so uh, it, it's a little bit more personal. I mean, I know clearly all the IT people by name, and you know, um, so, um, it's not as uh, hands-off as you might think. Um, I've, I've grown up knowing the technology and building things, although thank goodness um, for all the consumers, I don't program <laughs> anymore. <laughs> don't think I could. Uh, so I guess the answer is I'm, uh, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, and the reality is that it, it will change. Our business, I, m I mentioned that Mobile speed is three times that of internet speed. 
everything changes in, in your business model, your business itself, your organization changes. Uh, don't be surprised a year from now I'm not here. And that's not a failure on my part or anything, it's just we don't know what we need. Um, so um, we're trying to figure it all out. I, if, I get, if I get an answer that lasts more than a month, I'll, I'll give you a call. Right, my, my personal style is um, one of encouragement and development of people. Um, you saw how effective they were without me. <laughs> That's as hard as that is to do. It really works, it really works. Anything else, folks? Okay, now you have the, on the website, you can pull that uh, presentation down. You crack the DePetro code, you get a year subscription to any one of our websites, eGreetings, Blue Mountain, or ag.com. I'll take care of you. Uh, and I want to thank you for being patient. Thank you for coming, you know, taking time out of what I'm sure is a busy day. My hope, my hope is that at the conclusion of this, you really got some message out of here, something that you can take away, apply either in your personal life or to your company. It'll either benefit you as a person or your company in the future. And, and I do sincerely want to thank you for your attention. Thank you.